Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, linking T-cell clonotype to phenotype with TCR single-cell RNA-seq, presented by Mike Stubbington, PhD, Senior Staff Scientist, Wellcome Trust, Sanger Institute, and Tapio Lundberg, PhD, Postdoctoral Fellow, EMBL, EBI, Visiting Scientist at the Wellcome Trust, Sanger Institute. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Fluidime. We strive to partner with customers to pursue truth in the complex biological world. Leveraging our core technologies, microfluidics, and mass cytometry, we provide simplified and elegant workflows for single cell approaches to genomics and proteomics applications. Our C1 and Biomark systems enable the field of single cell genomics. Partner with us on your quest to characterize and understand individual cell function. Engage with us at fluidime.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the slide window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. And finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Thank you. Before we hear from the presenters, I would like to introduce Maxine McLean, PhD, Field Application Scientist for Fluidine. Hi, thank you, Judy. Um, before we hear from Mike and Tapio, I am just going to give a brief overview of the system that they use to collect the single cell data. Um, what we have, and is my audio okay? Um, hold on, I'm going to, okay, great, thank you. Uh, so this is, um, you know, single cell heterogeneity is, is nothing new to the field of immunology. Um, not only do you have, um, you know, rare subpopulations, but it, it's the complex interplay of these different cell types that makes up the immunological response. And, and so this has very much been, single cell resolution has very much been part of the paradigm in studying immunological physiology. Um, and this is particularly true with, with flow cytometry, uh, which looks at protein expression and phosphorylation at the single cell level. Um, and this has been the standard for, you know, for decades now. Um, the C1 for single cell genomics is really the, the genomics counterpart to that single cell level protein expression. And, and just to take a, um, I mean, this is relevant to uh, what Mike and Tapio are going to be talking about. One aspect of the immune response is looking at clonal expansion. Uh, you have a T cell with its TCR and it recognizes its cognate antigen and initiates a clonal response of cells of different phenotypes. Um, and the, the trick is that, you know, there, there's more than one clonotype typically that responds to an antigen response or an antigen presentation, um, you know, or to, to the immunological threat as a whole. And so how do you tease out um, those different clonotypes and, and the cell phenotypes that are expressed within those clonotypes? Uh, to, to really identify the clonotype definitively, you need the alpha and beta chain sequence of the TCR. And, and this is obtained by sequencing. It typically has been obtained using targeted primer sets. Um, and, and in some instances, you can uh, obtain some accompanying gene expression to infer some phenotypic analysis. Um, but, but this is categorically at the single cell level because it is the alpha and beta chain together that make the TCR specificity. Um, what, so you, you can use targeted primers um, that doesn't give you the full transcriptome to infer, to understand the cell phenotype um, or the, the collection of phenotypes that's involved in, in the clonotypic response. Um, and, and, and what we're going to see today is, is that by using whole transcriptome amplification, not only do you not need to use targeted primers to recover your alpha beta chain, but you then have the, the whole transcriptome at the single cell level um, not only to pick out known phenotypes, but, but for discovery um, where, where you don't know what these subtypes are that are in your clonal population. Um, and, and this uses 
uh, a very specific pipeline that, that Mike is going to talk about called Tracer. Um, but it also uses a very simple full-length transcript mRNA-seq workflow on the C1. And I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, here. And so this is our C1 system platform. Our mRNA-seq full-length transcript protocol uses the context, uses the context murder chemistry. Uh, when you're doing single cell genomics, you, you know, this has typically not been something that is, is easy to do. You have a very small amount of material in a single cell, um, and you want to recover as much of that material as possible. Um, and, and, and so that's the, that's, that's the challenge. Um, what the C1 provides is, is a very high quality um, level of transcript um, recovery. Um, and it does that on an automated embedded workflow. The C1 has only been out for a couple of years, but already if you type C1 fluidime into Google Scholar, there are, there are hundreds of citations that come up. So, so it's a, it is a well-vetted workflow, um, and, and it's one that's established. And, and one of the things that has been established in the literature is that with the C1, if you're looking for single cell genes, um, you detect the most genes um, out of single cell techniques. And that's especially useful when you're looking for low abundance transcripts. You can also, because you can use very high performance chemistries on the microfluidics, you can recover the full length transcript. And that's really the key for being able to recover the alpha beta chain out of this whole transcriptome data is that the full length transcript was amplified as part of the chemistry. Um, and, and lastly, uh, the microfluidics also provide a nice QC. Uh, after you capture your cells on our chip, you can then put that chip on the microscope. And, and this is something that we recommend all users do it at, at the bare minimum just to see which capture sites are, are occupied and, 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 you know, to make sure that your cells are nice and viable. But if you have phenotypic information in those cells, we absolutely recommend using your microscope to, to document that. And, and then that can be correlated with the cDNA um, after, your, after your amplification protocol. And so this is the general workflow. Um, normally, especially with immune cells, you're going to be looking for a certain subtype, for example, CD8 T cells, and you're going to use what normally whatever enrichment protocol you're already using, whether it's bead-based selection or, or facts, um, to enrich for a certain population. And then you're going to load those cells onto our chip, our consumable, um, our microfluidic chip, or IFC. And, and then you're going to put the IFC in the C1, and the C1 does the capture. It also does um, a, a wash and stain. Some folks do a, a stain of the cells on chip. Um, and then uh, you get, after the capture, you get your chip back. And that's where we recommend that you put it on the microscope, see what your capture efficiency was. And then at, at that point, you're ready to run the chemistry. And there's just a, you load your chemistry, whatever you're running. And in, in this instance, it was the Quintex Smarter um, chemistry for mRNA-seq. But, but you load that on the chip and then that is distributed into 96 reaction chambers. And so you have 96 individual single cell reactions that are occurring on our integrated fluidic circuit. Typically that runs overnight and you harvest it in the morning. Um, and then you do uh, your, your standard library prep prior to sequencing, put it on NGS. And then um, what is really key in, in this TCR protocol is the tracer data analysis pipeline. And this is just a picture of our chip. You can see there's a little arrow at the bottom that says load cells. That's where your sample goes. Um, and then these little numbers are on the side. Those are where the reagents are loaded. Uh, you know, where the, this pattern in the center, this, uh, you can see these little bars and lines. Um, those are, that's your microfluidic circuit. And this is actually what you put onto the microscope. It's made out of a clear polymer. And so if you have cell stains um, that are fluorescently visible, you can assess those um, the same way you would with, with cells on a slide. Um, and so today we're talking about mRNA-seq specifically for the application of T-cell receptor sequencing, uh, but, but the microfluidics is very much an open platform and there are a number of, number of applications that we have available. I mean, I, I refer to the C1 as, as sort of the Swiss army knife of, of single cell genomics. Um, and I just want to lead over to, um, so we have a number of, of protocols that Fluidime has developed in-house, and then we also have our user-developed applications, um, of which Tracer is one. And I will show you where you can find that on our website. It's on Script Hub. You'll see here is uh, Tracer. Uh, what we have available is not only our standard 
mRNA seq protocol that you will use with Tracer, but the instructions for setting up the data analysis pipeline. Um, and with that, I will I will hand it over to Mike and Tapia. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Maxine, for the introduction. Um, so, as Maxine said, we're going to talk today about some of the work that we've been doing to try and extract a bit more information from single cell RNA sequencing of um, T cells, CD4 T cells in this case, but it would work with CD8s as well, where we look at the TCR sequences and we think about clonality and the association between um, clonality and phenotype. Okay, so I'm going to talk first about the method and some of its performance characteristics. And then I'll pass over to Tapio, who will be talking about some of the biology that we've uh, done with this for the um, a, a proof of concept for this work. So just as, a, as an introduction to the T-cell receptor, which you may well not need, just to remind you that the, the key point here is that it's a uh, heterodimer made up of an alpha chain and a beta chain. And these chains, are this, this protein, this heterodimer is found on the surface of the T-lymphocyte. And these chains... Um, contain constant regions, which consist of the, uh, comprise the transmembrane domain and the intracellular domain and a, and a constant domain. And then they also have these variable regions, which are really key in determining the antigen binding specificity of the protein. And really it's the interface between the alpha and the beta chains that, that defines the antigen specificity. And we really uh, typically you can assume that the T cell expresses just a single T cell receptor with a single specificity on its surface. And of course, T cells do not recognize antigen in, um, on its own, they recognize antigen in the, in the um, context of its association with an MHC molecule on the surface of an antigen presenting cell. So the T cell receptor has um, specificity for both the antigen and the combination of antigen, or the combination of antigen and uh, MHC, the peptide MHC combination. Okay, so if every T cell expresses a single T cell receptor with a particular antigen specificity, then there must be sufficient diversity amongst T cell receptors uh, within the organism, within the mouse or human, to detect any possible invading pathogen uh, or other pathological event that they need to detect to successfully defend that organism against um, infection or disease. And so to get this huge diversity, it's not the case that there's a single gene for every T cell receptor, of course, there is in fact this process of VDJ recombination, which leads to an enormous amount of diversity in the TCR from a much smaller set of genetic material. And so in this cartoon, you can see um, a cartoon of the germline sequence uh, and what the beta locus looks like in cells that aren't T cells or cells that haven't yet developed into T cells. And you can see the constant region on the right and then these arrays of gene segments, so J genes, D genes and B genes. And so during um, VDJ recombination, during T cell development in the thymus, a D and a J gene are essentially randomly selected and they are joined together with excision of the intervening DNA. If this occurs successfully, a V gene, again from the array, is randomly selected and join to the DJ junction to hopefully produce a productive and successful uh, beta chain. And so if we look at this in terms of its temporal regulation, the beta chain recombines first in the thymus. If this is successful and it can be transcribed and translated to a um, beta protein, this then pairs with a surrogate alpha chain, but leads to signaling events which cause um, a burst of proliferation and then signal to allow alpha recombination. And so what you get, what can happen here, and what's important later on when we're thinking about clonality, is that you can have one T cell, a T cell that has a single um, beta recombinant event, and then it undergoes proliferation before recombining its alpha. So all of its progeny can have different alpha recombinants, and we'll come back to that uh, later on. One more thing to note about the diversity that occurs during VGJ recombination is that the, the process of joining, this process of recombination, is not... Um, precise. The ends of the junction, the ends of the segments as they are found in the recombined junction are not exactly as they are encoded in the germline. So the ends are chewed back by uh, exonuclease activity and then random non-templated nucleotides are added into the junction. So this means that the, the junctional region is the most diverse region of the entire re recombinant sequence and it's absolutely no coincidence that this junctional region encodes the loop known as CDR3, which has a really large effect, a large impact upon the uh, antigen specificity of the TCR. Okay, so if we think about just at the DNA level, the sequence space of paired chains, paired DNA sequences that, that could possibly be generated uh, during T-cell development, it's possible to estimate a number maybe up to 10 to the 21 different paired DNA sequences. And so this allows us to make an assumption 
that no two T cells arise independently in the thymus with exactly the same set of recombinants at the DNA level. And we can start to think about these TCR sequences as, as essentially a barcode for each T cell. And because these are diploid genomes, there are up to two alpha recombinants and two beta recombinants possible in every cell. And so this was, this was our starting point of thinking about these data. Um, and also something else that's important is if you want to get these paired chain information, this information about the alpha and beta pairs that are being expressed in T cells, which tells you two things. This gives you much higher confidence in your clonal relationships because you can see more sharing gives you higher confidence that the cells are genuinely clonally related. But also because it's the interface of the alpha and beta, the combination of the alpha and beta that defines antigen uh, PMHC specificity, really if you want to start thinking about antigen specificity, you need the paired combination and you need to know that. So it's entirely possible to take a bulk population of T cells and to sequence the alpha and the beta chains separately from that bulk population. And that does give you an idea of the diversity and the clonality that's present in your population, but it's not possible to take that, those data and work out the pairing of the alpha and the beta chains. Really, you need to maintain the single cell envelope and sequence the alpha and the beta chains within each individual cell to get that pairing information. And so this project really started from the fact that in the Teichmann group, we've for a while now been sequencing uh, single CD4 T cells, which we've been thinking of as a model of uh, cellular differentiation and the gene expression events that, that occur and change, the gene expression changes that occur during differentiation from the naive T cell to one of the affected T cell subsets. And so we've been generating um, single cell CD4 T cell uh, mRNA seq data with the C1. And when I came to this data, I really wanted to wonder, I wondered these um, TCR genes are expressed. They should be, they should have reads present in the data set, but we don't really look at them because their sequences are not um, present in the references. So can we take those, take our reads, assemble the TCR sequences, which we don't enrich for, we don't specifically amplify for in these data sets, but can we get them essentially for free from our single cell RNA-seq, which then gives us um, the single cell RNA-seq data, which can tell us about phenotype and heterogeneity within the populations. But also if we have the TCR sequences, we can think about cell lineage and clone expansion, and maybe start to correlate TCR sequences with transcriptional phenotype. So first, I'm gonna talk about the method, um, what it does, how it works, and then Tapio will tell you a bit about TCR populations that we see during an infection model, which we use as a proof of concept for, for this work. Okay, so the method um, starts with a pool of RNA-seq reads from each individual cell. And we first want to find the sequences that in that pool that came from a recombined T cell receptor, either alpha or beta. Once we fish those out, we want to assemble them into contigs. So we want to take the sequences, assemble them into overlapping contigs to really generate the full length T cell receptor sequence. Then, once we've assembled the contigs, we want to filter them to remove artifacts, remove truncated contigs, uh, remove things that aren't actually from the TCR, and find just the full length high confidence TCR contigs. Then we want to analyze those to say something about what the segments are that have been used, the VD and J segments, and what the junctional nucleotides are, which really tells us about the diversity that's present. So I'll go through um, how we do this, but first this is just a single schematic so showing that um, on the right you can see this pipeline of going through from choose selecting reads all the way through to assembling contigs. And on the left, you can see that we also have uh, reads from the rest of the transcriptome that we can use in any, your favored method for doing a transcriptome at the single cell level. Okay, so first, how do we fish out the contigs? Well, like I said, these sequences aren't annotated within the uh, reference genomes or the reference transcriptomes. So instead, we generate our own references for this step. And we've, we've been calling them combinatorial recombinomes. So whereas in a... Um, standard reference genome, you would have 21 chromosomes plus the mitochondria for mouse. And so you'd have 21 entries in that genome file in, in the input file you might give to an aligner. Um, here we make a, an entry, essentially you can think of it as a, an equivalent to a chromosome or as to a transcript in, in the transcriptome for every single combination of B and J that's present uh, downloaded from the reference uh, annotation in IMGT. So for the alpha locus, we have 256 V, v genes, 65 J genes, which gives us nearly 16 and a half thousand combinations. And for the beta locus, we have just under 1,000 combinations. And we want to align our reads against these combinations to find ones that map and maybe therefore come from TCRs. And so we also want to try and get reads, as many reads as possible here, deal with the fact that there's going to be some junction diversity. So um, firstly, if you look at the five prime end of the V gene, there's a set of ambiguous N nucleotides. So every V gene has a leader sequence. These are somewhat harder to find well annotated in the databases than the V genes themselves, but we wanted to um, align reads and get reads that come off the five prime end of the V into the leader sequence. So we put these ends in here to, to try and deal with that. 
Likewise, if you look at the uh, three prime end after the J gene, there's a region of constant gene sequence here. Again, just to absorb the reads, to map the reads that come from the end of the J into the constant gene. And then we also wanted to deal with the fact that there's junctional diversity and we don't try and have every possible combination. So deal with the 10 to the 21 possible pairs at the DNA level. We just put some ambiguous N nucleotides in here. And for the beta locus, we have seven Ns. For the alpha locus, we have a, a one N. But it's actually pretty flexible. It's, it's pretty robust to your choice number of Ns. But we do the um, mapping using Bowtie 2. So Bowtie 2 is an aligner that is very happy to align um, with gaps. So it will introduce gaps into the reference or into the um, read sequence. And it will also align happily against ends. And we give it very low penalties for doing these alignments. And so that means that it's really sensitive here and will align any read that looks like it might have come from a TCR. Okay, so we do this alignment, we take reads, and we do this alignment once for each locus, once for alpha, once for beta, with their specific reference recombinome. Once we've done that, we take the reads that align, that map, and we assemble them into contigs. And we do this using the de novo RNA-seq assembler Trinity. Now this is designed to do de novo assembly of entire transcriptomes from the whole set of reads that you might get from a um, sequencing experiment. But here we just give it the reads that look like they came from one of the TCRs. We allow it to assemble the contigs. And then we let it run, we run it and we see what we get. And we get output like this, which is essentially just a fast A file of sequences representing the contigs. And we found when we do this that quite often there are uh, more than one contig that represent a particular TCR. There are contigs that don't come from TCRs. There are contigs that um, are truncated versions of, of TCRs as well. So we want to filter these and we want to work out what we can say about um, the sequences that have been used. So we do this by passing all of the contig sequences through IgBlast. This is a published version of BLAST, which is specifically designed for alignment against recombined uh, immunoglobulin sequences, so Ig, uh, B cell receptor sequences or T cell receptor sequences. And like uh, any other version of BLAST, it gives you E values, which give you an idea of how good the alignment is. So we use those to filter out the, uh, the things that aren't actually TCRs. And we also make sure we collapse down the cases where more than one content represents the same T cell receptor sequence. So once we've done that, we end up with what we think are a high confidence set of T cell receptor sequences. And the output looks something like this. So for a particular cell, for um, a TCR, for the beta locus, we have two contigs. And these contigs contain this set of VD and J genes. And you can see in the second contig at the bottom, that um, the D segment hasn't been identified. And this is very common because the D segments are relatively short. They can be chewed back so much that they, there isn't enough of them to uh, unambiguously identify them. So that's, that's very common. And we reduce the entire 350 or so base pair sequence down to these unique identifiers, which exactly represent the sequence because um, TCR sequence, TCRs don't undergo somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation like B cell receptors we can use just the identities of the V and J segments and the junctional nucleotides to, um, to unambiguously identify them. And one more thing that's important when we look at these sequences is that due to the randomness at the junction of these sequences, two thirds of, every of all recombination events are non-productive. They lead to a frame shift, which means that the, protein, the, the gene cannot be successfully translated to a full length protein. And so we look to see if there are frame shifts introduced, if the whole thing is in frame, or if there are any stop codons. And then we define whether the sequences are productive or not. Okay, so given our set of sequences, we wanted to assess the performance of the tool to see how it works. So we used some proof of concept data um, of single cell RNA-seq from a mouse salmonella infection experiment. And, and Tapio will talk a little more about this uh, in the second half of the talk. But we had one mouse that was uninfected at the steady state from which we got after quality control, after microscopic imaging of the, um, of the chip and of assessing the data quality, we ended up with 50 cells from that mouse. We had two mice at day 14. Um, so at the peak of infection from which we had 71 and 39 cells. And then we had one mouse at day 49 out past the resolution of the infection from which we had 116 cells. So we ran tracer on the data from these cells and first, the first thing we wanted to look at was, can we get the full length of the TCR sequences reconstructed? Uh, yes, indeed we can. It, the blue distributions on this slide are the um, 
lengths that we reconstruct from the start of the V to the end of the J sequence uh, in every cell. The black dotted lines are the interportile range of the lengths that we see in the combinatorial combinome sequences. So in reality, these, um, these would be spread wider because we don't, we don't deal with any junctional diversity apart from the N nucleotides, which are always the same length in the combinatorial combinomes. But you can see here that nicely the, the blue distributions really do show that we're reconstructing full length TCR sequences in essentially every case. And this is, this is really nice. It's particularly useful for say the TCR alpha locus in mouse where gene duplication and triplication events have led to several V genes that are very, very similar to each other. And the only way to unambiguously tell them apart is to have the full length of the sequence have as much sequence information as possible. And we can really do that here to get high confidence assessment of the clonality. Okay, so we are reconstructing full length sequences. Do we do it very often? We do. So if we look at the percentage of change, so just the right hand column here, really, the number of cells where we see productive alphas and productive betas in the same cell. We see that we're seeing that in around 70 to 93% of cells. And this compares, well, this is about the same as people have seen before in previously published literature, where they've done targeted PCR amplification of um, single cells to look at the T cell receptor sequences and, and they report between 60 and 90% paired productive um, sequencing. So we think this is working about as sensitively as targeted PCR amplification. And that's, we were really pleased when we saw that. Something else on sensitivity is we sequence these cells relatively deeply. They were all sequenced at about 2 million to 4 million reads per cell. And we wanted to check, well, if you, if you reduce your sequencing depth for a cell, um, what do you see? So we subsampled, we took all of the cells from day 14 mass one, and we subsampled those cells from above 2 million reads to, to 2 million reads, to 1 million reads, to half a million, all the way down to 5,000 reads. And we did that three times independently for every cell. And we asked, can we reconstruct the same TCRs that we see from the full depth data? Um, also, as part of the pipeline, and to allow us to filter out artifacts, we quantify the expression of the TCRs that we see in every cell. And we do this by appending the reconstructed TCR sequences to the end of the mouse transcriptome. And then we quantify the reads using um, Callisto, which is a, a relatively new and very fast um, RNA-seq quantification algorithm. So here in this figure, we've plotted the uh, expression levels of the, each TCR with the minimum read depth required to see that TCR in two out of three of the um, subsample data sets. And you can see here that 92% of the TCRs are reconstructed pretty reliably at a million reads per cell, which we think is, is a good depth for doing single cell RNA-seq. But even if you go down to 100,000 reads per cell, you're still reconstructing over 60% of the TCR. So it works at read depths that you would typically aim to get at with a sequencing experiment. Okay, so we think we can get T cell receptor sequences using this method, but are they genuinely there? And so our colleague in the wet lab, Valentina, very kindly um, performed some PCR experiments to help us with this. So we, we adapted in a, a previously published approach from the Davis lab, which used targeted cDNA uh, on human T cells, on single human T cells. We redesigned the primers to work for mouse. And so we designed a single constant region primer, a reverse constant region primer, and then a set of multiplex primers to the V region, which allow us to amplify in the cDNA, the full length cDNA that we have for all of our cells. We amplified up, just targeted uh, the TCR sequences, we sequenced them and we then compared their sequences with the sequences we reconstructed um, from the RNA sequencing. And so we, we called events concordant if they had exact alignments or if there were some mismatches outside of the junctional region, outside of the CDR3, which we assumed because T cells don't undergo somatic hydrogen mutation, we assumed that these would be just due to sequencing error. And in fact, there were very few cells where this was the case. And I think the maximum number of mismatches was three anyway. So it was, it was not a large problem. We called uh, events as discordant if there were mismatches within the CDR3 uh, because we couldn't unambiguously say that those were not genuine or if there was no alignment at all. And when we did this, we found that there were 410 concordant events, which is really nice overlap with 80 that sequences that were only detected in RNA-seq and 35 that were only detected in PCR. Something I should say about the concordant events is that there were 19 cases where neither approach uh, detected any sequence and we counted those as concordant as well. So there are some that were only detected by one method and we wanted to try and get at what those were just to check that they weren't artifacts. So we did some manual inspection of the data. 
we found one example where it does look like um, essentially it's sequencing error that was the problem. And you can see that um, in these two sequences, these two sequences from the same cell differ by two Gs. Uh, these Gs, however, are in a long homopolymer G tract, and we know that these are hard to sequence and that these lead to sequencing errors. So we're not sure which of these is correct, but we only saw one of them. And this was nice. We didn't see any other obvious artifacts. Something else we did was we looked at the expression levels of the concordant sequences versus the discordant sequences. And we saw that either that both in the RNA-seq and in the PCR data, that the discordant sequences were expressed at lower levels than the um, concordant sequences. So what we interpret from this is that these discordant sequences are genuinely there, but they are the lowly expressed ones that there's just less chance of detecting them with both methods. And we're just increasing our sensitivity by having two methods. Okay, so we think that the data work. We think that the method works. We're happy with the method. And now I'm just going to pass over to Tapio to talk about TCR populations that we see during an infection model and what we can uh, infer from those data. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. So I will just very briefly now introduce the biological motivation behind this work. Um, basically, we are interested in CD4 T cells because they are the key regulators of the immune system. And they have the ability to, upon activation, to undergo functional differentiation into multiple uh, specialized subsets, for example, TH1s, TH2s, uh, TH17, and so on and so forth. And this differentiation happens in response to the nature of the invading pathogen. And, and to a large, de a large uh, de degree, this, uh, the nature of this uh, differentiation also dictates the nature of the immune response against that specific pathogen. And something to keep in mind is that at the same time as the T cells differentiate, they also undergo very rapid clonal proliferation. So if we consider any given peptide epitope, we know that there are only as few as, as few dozens or few hundreds of T cells that are able to specifically respond to that epitope. But on the other hand, these extremely rare cells are able to very quickly proliferate and, and produce hundreds of thousands of, of effector cells. And of course, then when the infection has been resolved, most of these um, effector cells are eliminated by apoptosis. So as a result, we can consider the T cell response as extremely dynamic. So basically, when we carry out single cell sequencing of, of T cells, uh, this is what we can expect to see when we look at the TCRs. Um, basically, we can assume that all the naive cells are going to be unique in regard to the TCR structure because they have not undergone uh, any proliferation. And also within the pool of the memory cells, we don't expect to see much clonal expansion. Uh, there might be some based on the previous immunological history of the animal, but in the case of uh, mice bred in SPF conditions, this should not be too significant. Um, of course, then among the effector cells during infection, this is completely different and we can expect to see uh, clones that are significantly expanded because these cells have been quite recently uh, selected into proliferation based on their TCR specificity. And this has been very well documented, for example, during salmonella infection before. So our goal was to study the uh, uh, dynamics of CD4 T cell response against the salmonella infection. So salmonella is basically a widely used model for, for TH1 differentiation in mouse. And during the infection, these TH1 cells play a protective role. Um, they secrete interferon gamma, and this way they activate macrophages uh, in the liver and the spleen. Um, to be able to study antigen experienced cells, we sorted them based on CD44 and CD62L expression. And we studied mice first at day 14, which is very close to the peak of the infection when the fraction of, of activated T cells is close to its maximum. And we also sorted similar population from healthy control mice, day zero. And also we wanted to study memory cells. So we sorted CD127 high cells from, from mice uh, seven weeks after the infection, when we know that the bacteria have been already cleared. And in the following slides, I'm going to briefly show some of the data. And this is, so these are basically single cells represented by these pink spheres. And um, 
the red and, and blue bars then within the spheres, these represent detected TCR uh, subunits. So, so the red one uh, represents TCR alpha and the blue one TCR beta. And then the edge is connecting these cells represent shared TCR strands um, between the cells. So again, red for alpha and, and, and uh, blue for beta chain. So this is the data from one mouse at, at day 14 of infection. So as you can see, we could detect the TCRs from 66 single cells. And among these cells, we could detect several cases where, where the strands were, where the TCR sequences were shared by the cells, indicating clonal families. And as, as you can see, there's one that contains as many as 10 single cells right in the, in the center. And um, something to, to, to note is that in almost all the cases where we detected both alpha and beta chains uh, among these cells in these clones, uh, the cells shared both of them. There were actually only two cases where cells shared only the beta chain. But like Mike already mentioned, this is also biologically plausible because we know that the beta chain recombination takes place first and it's followed by a proliferation burst of the cells and only after that the alpha chain is recombined. So it's, it's completely possible for cells to have the same beta chain but a different alpha chain. So then when we looked at the um, uninfected control mouse, as, in, as expected, we couldn't detect any expanded clones because these cells have not done any recent proliferation. So basically this serves as a useful sanity check for, for the data. Uh, here is the summary of, of the data from all of the four different mice we studied. So first is the uninfected control and top right is the first mouse from day 14, which you already saw. So basically we had uh, 10 expanded clones and the largest one contained as many as 10 single cells. Uh, the the uh, next one in the bottom left is then the second replicate from day 14. And in this case, we could actually detect only four expanded clones and this is largely caused by the fact that we only had 39 high quality cells from, from that mouse. So our possibilities for detecting the clones were somewhat limited. Uh, and the last panel is then at the week seven uh, memory cells. Again, we could detect several expanded clonotypes, each containing from two to six uh, single cells. And an interesting byproduct of this analysis that was in addition to these clones, we could actually detect a subpopulation of cells that represented completely different type of, of T cells, so which is the invariant natural killer T cells. And um, these cells are called invariant because they express a defined fixed set of, of TCR sequences. And instead of binding to class 2 MHC on the antigen presenting cell, uh, these cells bind to CD1 and they respond to for example, to certain lipid antigens presented by the APCs. And the NKT cells can very rapidly upon activation produce high amounts of cytokines, so they can be considered as sort of an early warning signal in the immune system. And of course, there are some surface markers that can be used for ident identifying and isolating these NKT cells. For example, NK1.1. And in fact, what we tried to do was we sorted cells to be NK1.1 negative. So we tried to exclude them already during, during their fact sorting. But um, to be honest, the NK1.1 is not a terribly specific marker. So it's not expressed by all NKT cells all the time. And for example, it has been reported that during salmonella infection, NKT cells can downregulate it. And at the same time, some conventional CD4 T cells can express it in some conditions. So basically the only truly reliable way to identify these NKT cells would be to test the TCR specificity. So in practice doing uh, tetramer staining with the, uh, with the lipid antigen that uh, these cells are, are known to recognize. But of course, in most cases, this is not terribly convenient thing to do. But luckily with the tracer approach, we could then study the TCR sequences and look for these known uh, NKT specific TCRs. And this way we could actually identify 12 contaminating NKT cells within our data set. And of course we could then clean up the data and, and exclude these cells from any further analysis with it. Um, so in conclusion, we could see evidence of, of infection induced clonotype expansion 
even in these relatively small cell populations. And from the one mouse where we detected 66 cell, cells, um, among those we could detect as many as, as 10 expanded clones. So once we had identified these clones, we then wanted to find out whether there was any correlation between the clonality and the functional state of the cell. So basically, to find out whether the clonally related cells behave the same way during the infection. And of course, with the tracer, we had both the sequence information and still we had the full uh, transcriptome. So this was a fairly easy comparison to do. And just to remind you, we have cells from three different time points. We have the, uh, the, the red cells, which are the healthy control. And then the blue cells are day 14, uh, the peak of the salmonella infection. And the green ones are the memory cells from week seven. And basically what you can see here is independent component analysis of this, of this data. So it's basically a means of reducing the, the dimensionality of the data while still retaining the useful biological information. So one can basically interpret the results pretty much the same way as with, for example, principal component analysis. And what you can see is that these cells are segregated quite uh, clearly by the time point, although there is some overlap um, between the day 14 and, and the day 49 uh, memory cells. And then to gain further biological insights into this, uh, we were looking at expression of known subset specific marker genes. We started with no genes known to be associated with differentiated Th1 phenotype. So this is basically a set of 200 or so genes that were identified in a previous RNA, RNA-6 study, so a bulk RNA-6 study. And on the right, you can see the cumulative expression of this gene set overlaid on the single cells with the uh, darker colors representing higher expression. And, and this way we could then identify the population of cells which express the highest uh, amount of these uh, Th1 specific RNAs. And this way we could identify the cells which are likely to be the most differentiated Th1 effector cells. Um, I want to highlight that, of course, this is by no means very um, specific or very precise analysis, but it's quite useful for just illustrating the general structure of the data and, and briefly showing the potential contained within the data, which can then be exploited by more thorough analysis. Um, so the same way we then wanted to identify where the memory cells were along this spectrum of uh, differentiation states. And there are several markers. For example, here we used uh, IL-7 receptor or the CD127 molecule. And as expected, of course, this was expressed by most of the week seven cells, but also by some of the day 14 uh, cells. And we were very confident that these were effector memory cells because they did not express a central memory marker CD62L or, or CCR7, for example. And, and CCR7, on the other hand, was found in most of the cells from the, um, from the uninfected control. So those were uh, likely to be central memory cells. Finally, we were looking into proliferation markers. This is a panel of seven genes, including KI67. And we could see that these were expressed by some of the day 14 cells. So basically these are likely to be the early Th1 effectors, which are still in the uh, proliferative phase of the, of the response. So basically this way we could very roughly identify these four functional states among the data, the early and the late Th1s and the central and the effector memory cells. So in the beginning I asked whether the clonality somehow influenced or restricted the functional state choices of the single cells. And what you can see here are members of this, of this single clone, so the sibling cells uh, overlaid on this ICA data. And as you can see, they are fairly evenly dispersed across all these functional states. So this suggests that the cells of a single T cell clone can uh, differentiate in an asynchronous way and they can at the same time uh, populate multiple distinct functional compartments. And, and we had several of such examples. And, and basically in all cases where we had more than a couple of, of uh, cells from a clone, we could see that these sibling cells fell into, into different functional compartments, basically indicating that they are uh, very likely to, to um, uh, differentiate at asynchronous rates. 
Um, so basically, in conclusion, with the tracer, we could um, at the same time define the clonotypes, and then we could, by studying the genome-wide transcription of the phenotype, we could um, we could um, determine the functional states of those cells. And we saw that the expanded clones contain cells at multiple stages of differentiation at the same time. And, and they contain both effector TH1 cells and memory cells uh, at the same time. Finally, we just want to highlight that there are several other potential applications for the tracer, which we have not um, shown here in the interest of time. First of all, one could study T cell phase choices in more detail during infection, for example, T helper cell subset choices. And, and for example, lymphocytes, uh, phenotypes and clonality during cancer, for example, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And of course, one obvious application is following B cell affinity maturation by, by tracking the expression of immunoglobulin genes the same way that here we, we track the expression of, of the TCR genes. Um, of course, finally, we want to acknowledge everybody who contributed. Uh, our our uh, team leader, Sarah Teichmann, uh, basically the whole team, and especially the lab of Gordon Dugan, who were really instrumental in, in carrying out the salmonella experiments. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll be happy to take questions. Okay, um, before we get to the questions, just very quickly, I want to thank you all for your informative presentations. And um, I'd like to tell you a little more about Dr. Stubbington and Lundberg. Dr. Stubbington undertook his undergraduate studies at the University of Cambridge and then spent five years as a research scientist for the UK Health Protection Agency. He then returned to Cambridge for his PhD at the Babraham Institute, where he investigated VDJ recombination in developing B cells. Dr. Stubbington then left the lab bench for a purely computational postdoctoral fellowship in Sarah Teichmann's group at the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute. The group recently moved to the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, where Stubbington is now a senior staff scientist. Dr. Lundberg completed his MSc and PhD studies at the University of Turku, Finland. During his PhD with Professor Rita Lahaspa, he studied the in vitro differentiation of primary human T helper cells using transcriptomics and proteomics methods identifying new candidate genes involved in this process. In 2013, Dr. Lundberg joined the Teichmann lab at EMBL EBI, currently at WTSI, as a postdoctoral fellow. In his postdoctoral work, he has focused on using single cell mRNA sequencing to understand the fate decisions of T helper cells during pathogen challenge in vivo. Okay, now it's time for Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like to ask Drs. McLean, Stubbington, or Lundberg, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Question number one is for Mike. Is it possible to use tracer for B cell receptor sequencing? And if not, any plans to implement that? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, great. Uh, so, yes, certainly that's uh, an obvious extension of, of using Tracer. It's not something that we have implemented at the moment. It's something that we really want to do and is definitely on our list. So one of the considerations with B-cell receptor sequencing is somatic hypermutation and the fact that the V uh, D and J regions can vary due to mutation during affinity maturation. Uh, we're pretty confident that the um, alignment and contig assembly steps would deal with that just fine because we're not using stringent parameters at all for the alignment step. But in terms of thinking about clonality, we would have to change from looking just for exact sharing to a more distance-based approach uh, to think about the networks of, of possible clones. But yeah, we're, we're very interested in, in that extension. Number two is for you as well, Mike. I don't have any, uh, any bioinformatics background at all. What kind of help uh, will I need to set up Tracer for myself? Okay, so in terms of getting Tracer set up, 
it's really at the moment at a stage where you need to be able to just perform single cell RNA sequencing bioinformatics. So I think you need familiarity with the command line. Uh, it has some dependencies that need installing, which are pretty well documented on the uh, GitHub or the script hub pages. So I think you probably should speak to a bioinformatician who, or be one yourself, uh, who's also going to be doing your gene expression analysis data anyway, I would imagine. Um, so we're always aiming to make it more easy to install. We've, we've got some plans for doing that, uh, but yes. And also just in terms of throughput, I think obviously single cell analysis is better performed in highly parallel environments. So on research clusters and, and things like that, but uh, it, it runs pretty quickly anyway, so it doesn't take too much compute to run. Okay, Mike, this one's for you. What are the rules in which the parts of the CDR3 region are randomly spliced and can C1 system track that? From our system, it seems there's a huge variety of how big those pieces are. Okay, so if that question's about kind of how, how big of a uh, random junction that the, um, the tool can deal with, that's, that's quite interesting. So we do see differently sized junctions in our data, although none of them are completely huge. I know that in gamma delta T cells, which is another avenue that I think we're interested in going down with this, junctions can be much longer and we need to work out how to address that. So I know I've looked at some very long junctions and um, IG Blast can deal with those just fine. So, so long as we can assemble them and extract them from the data, we'll be okay. I think if, the, if you were expecting long junctions and it was performing poorly, you'd probably want uh, to extend the lengths of the N nucleotides in the combinatorial recombinome files to try and deal with that. And that's again, something that we're thinking about uh, for the future. Okay, Mike, this one's for you. Okay. Can you compare this approach with Adaptive's ImmunoSeq approach when alpha and beta paired sequences can be obtained using bulk T cell RNA seq dilution statistical probability approach? Sure, so that's a, that's a really nice, clever method. Um, so our, our version differs in, in a few ways. So one is that I think pair seq requires a certain amount of um, clonal expansion to, so that you have sufficient chance of seeing the same T cell with the same pairs in multiple wells so that you can deconvolute those pairs uh, using their statistical approach. We don't need that. So we can see T cell sequences uh, just from individual cells that aren't clonally expanded at all. And, and that may be interesting in certain circumstances. Um, I think the other thing that we can see that as far as I know the pair seq approach doesn't deal with is that we can see cells that express multiple alphas or multiple betas. So we can, we can see the cases where the, the non-productively rearranged chain is expressed at the mRNA level, uh, which again helps us really to get high confidence uh, clonality assessment. We can also see the cases where two productive alphas are expressed, uh, and we see that in around 26% of cells, and, and I think the reported percentage is around 30%. So um, again, that's, uh, that's something that I think is quite interesting. Uh, we can also see the cases which are much rarer where um, allelic exclusion at the beta locus hasn't been complete. And we can see uh, uh, in the single digit percentages of cells that have two or appear to have two productive betas. Um, and I don't believe that PEARSEQ is expecting cells with more than one alpha and one beta. Okay, the next one is for Mike as well. Can you review what, I believe it's confidence methods you use to assemble and align? Are those adjustable in Tracer? And what's the impact of lowering confidence on the diversity one can detect? Um, yes, so at the moment they're not adjustable. We set essentially the minimum possible penalties for Bowtie 2 for doing the alignment. So, we think that's about as sensitive as it, it, as it can go um, without just, uh, if you don't give it any, any penalty, it doesn't work. Um, in terms of the assembly, we just use Trinity's defaults, which appear to work pretty well. 
something that I think would be interesting to do is to maybe try different assemblers, maybe Velvet um, and some others. But we find at the moment that Trinity works quite well. So I'm not sure we can reduce the stringency on the assembly, uh, on the alignment, sorry. Um, but thinking about the assembly again, as we go forward and continue to develop this tool, I think that might be useful. Okay, this one is for Tapio. Would this approach be practical if one was using human peripheral blood and looking for, say, a viral responsive CD8 cells? Uh, I, I would say, in theory, yes, as long as you have a convenient way of isolating your, your antigen experience cells, and if you can assume that your sample contains a reasonable fraction of your, of your cells of interest. So I, I would say, in theory, certainly. Okay, this one is for you, um, Tapio. What were the typical number of cells you started with to get between 39 and 116 high quality cells for sequencing? Um, so, so I think we loaded, first of all, we loaded 5,000 cells on the, on the C1 chip, which is actually a bit more than you, than you need. Um, the capture rate, I would say was usually uh, about 70% single cells. So with the T cells, we get more, I would say we get more usually double cells than, than empty sites. But this can, but this can be optimized based on your uh, cell numbers that you load on the chip. And then after the sequencing, we have to eliminate some cells uh, based on routine quality control. But that's, I would say, usually only less than 20% of, of the single cells that we sequence have to be discarded at that point. Maxine, this one is for you. How do you decide how many cells minimum you need from a clonally expanded population to be loaded? Um, some may be larger than others, say blasting versus not. That's one thing I'm struggling with in my system. About how many cells. Um, it, uh, you know, the question of how many cells is, is a universal question when you're looking at single cell data. And what is very helpful to do is, is to run a, a paired um, bulk um, reaction where you look at the diversity um, within that bulk reaction. And, and as you run your single cell data, the, the idea is that you recombine your single cell data into one pile. Um, and that should be the same as, as your bulk data. And, and that's when you know how many cells you've run. So there's not one answer. Um, I will say normally it, it is more than 96. Normally you're talking about a couple of, of chips. But, um, but what we find is, you know, it, it, it depends on the diversity in your sample. And, and so that's why running that bulk companion is important. Um, and I can, I, I've seen the question list. Would you like Maxine, I, um, I'll pose this one to you next. Um, is the C1 technique as sensitive as race PCR? Say that um, targeted, targeted approaches are typically more sensitive than um, non-targeted. And non-targeted was the approach that was used here with the Oligo DT. Um, now, that is in a side by cell, side by side, you know, volume, same volume, same, you know, all variables the same. When you put a reaction on the C1, you're, you're making it a, a microfluidic reaction. Um, and that affords certain benefits in, in the sensitivity. Um, and and I, I will say that even side by side targeted and non-targeted on the C1, targeted is a little bit better. Um, but the gains that you make by going into microfluidics on non-targeted are um, basically, they're, they're, they're very close. Um, so even though the difference may be fairly strong, you know, when you're running these two you know, non-targeted versus, for example, five prime race in, in a multi-well plate format, you run them both on the C1, the targeted, for example, five prime race may be a little bit better. But 
I mean, as, as Mike and Tapio showed, they get a, you know, a very, very high level of recovery of the alpha beta chain um, comparable to, you know, to, to any other method. So you, you'd have to run a side-by-side -side comparison to really say, I, I think that on the C1, these non-targeted methods, though, do perform very strongly due to the microfluidics. Okay. Um, Maxine, I'd like to put this next one to you. Um, what is the cell capture efficiency and how many cells are you able to load per chip? So that is a, a number that we recommend researchers uh, titrate. What, what I have seen from working with folks who are running T cells on the C1 is that the capture efficiency, um, if you're getting a good capture, is, is typically in the 70 to 75 percent range. And, and I think that the numbers that Tapio got are, are in the paper, if I recall. Um, if you're getting below that, I mean, what I tell folks is, you know, if, you, if your parameters aren't optimized, your capture efficiency isn't going to meet, um, you know, it, it's not going to be as good as it could be. And so um, if you're getting, for example, 50 percent or lower, you know, reach out to either your FAS or tech support and, and we will work with you to bring it up. Um, you know, those numbers are for loading a, a couple hundred cells per microliter. Um, so, you know, you multiple, so you're basically loading a, around a thousand cells to get optimum capture efficiency um, in a five to six microliter volume. Um, now, we are looking into optimizing these parameters further. That is not a, I want to be very clear that that's not something that has been titrated. This is almost from anecdotal evidence of looking at different T cell runs. Um, but 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 it's in that range. Uh, hopefully we will have some, um, I, you know, as more folks run T cells and as we get more data, we will have some more fine-tuned recommendations on exactly how many cells to load. Okay, Mike, this next one is for you. What's the turnaround time for data analysis? What's the minimum number of TCR epitope detected in single cell mixture? Okay, so in terms of data analysis, uh, we run this on our cluster. Um, so we give it, I think, five compute cores. It takes a relative amount of large, relatively large amount of memory. I think maybe 10 to 15 gigabytes. I mean, this is not larger than you tend to need for generally doing RNA seq experiments. Um, so it fits within, I think, the envelope of what you would need to, to analyze these data to do transcriptomics as well. Um, it tends to run the, the data sets that we've used run within half an hour per cell. I think to go from um, the raw reads through to having re, uh, the recombined, reconstructed sequences. And then the, the way to, the summary to, to generate those network diagrams and to summarize your entire experiment runs in seconds. So it's, it's relatively quick um, and of the same order of magnitude of anything else you will do with single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, in terms of the numbers that we get, um, I, if I understand that question correctly, so uh, as we showed, we see reconstruction of TCRs in most cells. Uh, from good, good quality experiments, we can reconstruct a TCR in most cells. I've seen some data sets where the sequencing uh, depth has been very low, so we don't get that. But I think in almost every case, we see paired productive sequences in over 50% of the cells that we see. And the clonality, the number of different ones that are present there depends entirely on the population that you're looking at. So if you're looking in the uninfected mouse, like we showed, then every TCR is different. If you're looking in a highly clonally expanded population, such as spleen during salmonella infection, then we can see those big clone types. We're almost out of time, so this will have to be our last question, and it goes to Tapia. Thanks for the great presentation. Would you please reiterate what biological questions you can answer by having both the clonotype sequence and functional state of the cell Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there's a number of things that one can look at. For myself, one interesting possibility is to actually use the TCR sequence as, as kind of a cellular barcode and then study how, how sibling cells originating from, from the 
um, common mother cell behave during infection and how those cells choose their cell fates and whether they all behave the same way or, or different way. Of course, then, if you know, for example, what is the, what is the, uh, the exact epitope recognized by your cells, then that's hugely informative, for example, if you study um, a specific antigen, uh, specific populations, for example, in vaccine or, or some, some kind of scenario related to that. Thank you. I would once again like to thank Maxine McLean, Mike Stubbington, and Tapio Lundberg for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? Maxine, would you like to go first? Um, yes, hi. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that really excites me about this technique, I mean, we, we are in a, a new era for immunogenomics, and, and having the whole transcriptome matched with the clonality, I think, provides a, a new level of, of resolution that, that wasn't really, I mean, you couldn't, there, there was no way to, to get it but before, um, you know, any, any other way. You can't take alpha beta chain um, and match it back with the bulk gene expression. You really need that single cell resolution. And I think that's very promising because, I mean, what, what I'm finding as I'm talking to researchers is that it's, Everybody, not everybody, but you know, there's a lot of folks who are very much in the discovery space, and that is the real power of RNA seq. And so to find that now we can pull the clonality out of that as well, um, I, I think that we'll see this technique implemented very, very frequently. So, so thank you, thank you both, Mike and Tapio. It's been a pleasure to listen to you all present it firsthand. I, thank you. Um, I think we, we are really excited about where we can go with this, um, really pleased as it works and looking forward to investigating lots more immunology with it. Um, definitely interested to receive emails and to help people if you're having trouble with the tool or if you have any questions or, or ways that it would, it, we could make it better um, because it's still under development and we're going to keep using it ourselves and keep developing it. So please do get in touch. Thank you all once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Fluidine, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 26, 2016. You'll receive an email from Labyrinths letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>